Welcome back to It's Haunted, What Now? I'm your host, Lainey. As we move into October, I've started to think a lot more about how we all gravitate to these horror stories more at this time of the year. It's getting darker sooner, and there's a chill in the air that can't be ignored anymore. It feels more right at this time of year, something that people have been doing for centuries at this exact time of year. Huddling around a warm fire, having something hot to drink, and telling stories about what goes bump in the night. It's hard to feel very alone when you frame it like that, you know? So, come close. Sit next to the fire with me as we move ever closer to Halloween. Let's tell some spooky stories here, together. Okay, ready to get spooked? Our first story comes from Hushabai Secret, who brings us a deceptively charming story of an imaginary friend who might not have been so imaginary after all. Growing up in the 90s, I spent most of my time outside playing with the neighborhood kids. I didn't live in the greatest neighborhood, so I couldn't go out exploring. But all of my neighbors had kids my age, except for one. They had an old house with garbage across the yard and junk piled up so high in the windows that you couldn't even see inside. The only noticeable objects that I can remember were an old Barbie camper and a teddy bear with a missing ear. I knew there was someone that lived there because their hideous red Chevy would leave the driveway every day at noon and not return until about nine at night. One night, the car came back as usual. The next day, there was a boy standing in the yard and waving at me. I was playing in my backyard when I saw him. I remember being confused, but excited to meet someone new that was my own age. I found out his name was Brandon, and I'd always invite him to play with me outside after school. My mom never questioned me about my new friend and let him play in the backyard with me. I never saw him at school and he explained that his grandma taught him from home inside their house. I didn't want to play with the other neighborhood kids as much as I wanted to play with Brandon, so the two of us formed our own little group. Nobody really questioned it until one day. I told my mom that I wanted to have school at my house like Brandon did. She finally asked me where I met Brandon and I told her that he lived in the junk house in the neighborhood. I remember the look on my mom's face being confused and concerned at first, but then she laughed in my face and told me that I was being ridiculous. Brandon was my imaginary friend, she told me. He had to be, because nobody had lived in that house since the 70s. I got mad at her and said that I would prove that Brandon was real and that he would be outside the next day. But he never showed up. I waited for him every day, but I never saw him again. Eventually, we moved across town into an apartment building. I made new friends and forgot about Brandon. A few years ago, however, I felt nostalgic and decided to go for a drive through my old neighborhood. Not much had changed, and seeing the old neighborhood made me happy, bringing back a lot of fun memories. I passed the old junk house. It was obviously abandoned, but after all these years, the old Barbie camper and the teddy bear with the missing ear were still in the window. I saw that and laughed at how I'd stuck to the idea that my imaginary friend was real, until I saw my ball. An old ball with my name written on it in big black ink was clearly visible from the window. The rainbow colors made it stick out like a sore thumb. I'd lost that ball around the time I had first met Brandon. Maybe one of the neighbor kids had stolen it years ago and had hidden it away, and I was just now noticing it. Maybe Brandon was just a figment of my overactive childhood imagination. Or maybe there was someone watching me back then, and I was too innocent to see anything else other than a new friend. Thinking about it now, it does creep me out. More than anything, I wish I had answers. If he really was real, if he was another kid playing a prank, or if he was a lost spirit, it bothers me that I'll never know for sure but I'll always have the memories, as creepy as those memories might be. A 
As someone who has a child of their own now, it's hard to imagine what my reaction would be if my daughter came home and told me about a friend I'd never seen, living in a house that I know no one lived in. I would honestly feel terrified and it would be very hard for me to hide that from her, but I think moms have this superpower where they're able to hide almost anything from their children, especially if they're scared. So needless to say, hopefully this was just a figment of your imagination. But I think all of us who listen to this podcast regularly and those of us behind the scenes who read these stories all the time, I think we all might know that it isn't a figment of your imagination. Our next story is from Alien Carr, who has a strange story that happened during an otherwise picturesque Italian holiday. Back in 2019, my girlfriend and I went on a vacation in Ponza, an Italian island. Everything went well except for a bit of rain on our last day there. There hadn't been much and the streets were fairly dry, but the sky was gray and we came back to our little rented house around 5pm because of the weather. Quickly, we were bored. We needed to wait another few hours until our restaurant dinner, so I decided that we should visit the only part of the island we hadn't seen yet. We got on my motorbike and went to Calafonte, which we discovered was completely abandoned due to a collapse that had happened in 2017. The neighborhood, the beach, and the restaurant were all completely deserted. No one lived there, not a single tourist either, or even any cars in sight. I kept driving until we wound up at a dead-end street, somewhere near a football field. There, we saw two kids playing football at the end of the street. The street was exactly like the others, Everything closed, not a sign of human occupancy for miles around. So, where did these kids come from? My girlfriend and I got closer, already a little freaked out, but I wanted to talk to them, figuring that maybe they'd at least have directions for somewhere else to go. The kids were no more than six or seven years old and dirty as well. Think coal mine dirty. One of them had a dirty white t-shirt and the other only wore ragged pants, They were both barefoot and their heads were completely shaved. The shirtless kid also had a circular wound, almost like a hole, right in the middle of his chest, still red like it had just happened. I approached and asked them for directions, but even though they answered me, I couldn't understand a thing. They were speaking in a local dialect, or even an Italian. It was completely incomprehensible. They kept chattering and pointing at my bike, but seeing as we couldn't understand a thing, we said goodbye and left. I could see them staring at us through my rearview mirrors as we left. My girlfriend and I both swear they were some sort of spirits, children who died in some sort of conflict. It might not sound like much, but it's my only paranormal story, and it's an experience that I can't explain. Okay, so honestly, I'm surprised you both made it as far as you did into the abandoned area. I feel like the vibes would have been completely creepy. And to see such strange children like that, it's enough to turn any holiday into something terrifying. Also, brave of you to venture in a place you have no idea about, because I would never. Next, we have not one, but two stories from Mind Your Muse podcast. They come to us first with a story of a long road trip, and a long-awaited rest at a B&B. That didn't end up quite the way they planned. I was traveling across a region in Quebec called Saguenay-Lac-Saint-Jean with a friend of mine. We spent our holiday there, sleeping in B&Bs, after many hours out on the road with plenty of tiring outdoor activities in the open air and sun, we were glad to arrive at nightfall at our next B&B and check in. As soon as our host showed us our room, I was immediately hit with a horribly unpleasant smell. Imagine a mixture of years worth of moist, old rugs, mothballs, and cat pee, like a reclusive shut-in's home. 
Needless to say, I was a bit discouraged. I didn't dare mention the smell to my friend, nor to the owner of the B&B, not wanting to be rude. I disregarded it, thinking my sense of smell might have been heightened because of how tired I was. Besides, what could we do? It was late at night, our room was already booked, and there was nowhere else for us to go. As soon as we were alone, my friend turned to me and asked if I could smell it. I said I could, but what choice did we have? We went to get our luggage from the car. When we returned, the air was breathable again. The smell was gone. I didn't think much of it. Exhausted, I just wanted to go to bed and go to sleep. That night, while I slept soundly, my friend was plagued with nightmares. The next morning, she told me she'd seen a shadow pass by the mirror. My friend is usually quite down to earth, so I was a bit surprised when at breakfast, she asked in front of everyone if there was a ghost in the B&B. Without missing a beat, our host immediately lit up. Aunt Marie Therese? Yes, of course. The owner went on to explain that her aunt's ghost is quite benevolent and sometimes helps her out around the business, closing doors and such. When we checked out, I ended up having to go back inside to retrieve a jacket I'd left behind. Never in my life have I been so torn between the fear and the hope of seeing something paranormal. Also, a strong smell doesn't just disappear like that. It's usually the result of years of living a certain neglected lifestyle and takes a long time to get rid of. This experience left me with more questions than answers, but I have to admit, I'm fascinated. Okay, so this one is creepy. You're right that a strong smell doesn't just appear and disappear out of the ether so quickly, unless, of course, you're my dog who's farting and it's disgusting. So I feel like I've heard stories like this before about strange smells being associated with hauntings. So this absolutely tracks. I just wonder how the owner of the B&B manages to handle that happening so often and how many refunds she has to give. Our next story, again, comes from Mind Your Muse podcast and it involves their daughter and some strange apparitions that she seemed to have been seeing in her bedroom. This story involves my lovely daughter, She's had a few experiences, leaving me to wonder if she has a certain sensitivity to these things. Before I go on, I know many people might be tempted to debunk her experience as just a dream, her imagination, or even sleep paralysis. Of course, these thoughts have occurred to me. Yet I chose to tell her I believed her, so she won't feel alone in this. I want her to be able to come to me if she has experiences that scare her. One night, when she was in her bed... I walked up to her room and saw her through her open door with her eyes open, crying. I must have thought at first it was nothing more than a tactic to stall sleeping, as she was really difficult to put to bed. I don't quite remember how I reacted seeing that, but I'm sure I went to reassure her nonetheless. She was often prone to night terrors when she was a toddler and would wake me up with her screams. It was only later that she started to tell me that she would see a man in farmer's clothing holding a pitchfork, walking towards her room. She told me that the man looked angry and seemed like he was yelling, even though no sound came out of him. The moment he entered the room, however, he vanished. Of course, I told her that she must have dreamed it, but she was defensive, adamant that it hadn't been a dream. She must have been about four years old when this happened, but she can still tell the story with perfect recollection, and her memory never wavers. She later saw another silhouette leaning against her bookcase. 
The image of the second man didn't seem menacing to her though, of course, still scary, so it seems to have been a different manifestation. We all know our kids and how they can tell tall tales or lie, and the reasons they do it. My daughter never had an imaginary friend, nor has she ever used her imagination to get attention. I chose to take her word for it and make her fears heard and acknowledged. So I've often thought about this too because I was very sensitive as a child growing up and you guys have heard my doll story so you know, but I'm challenged in the way of how I would respond to this with my daughter. My initial reaction is to always comfort and acknowledge and validate the experience. And so I feel like I would be doing the same thing. I would validate their experience and how they felt and not try to dissuade them from whatever feelings they had. That being said, building trust with your child is something that I can absolutely get behind. And I want to give you massive kudos for that. Our final story today comes from Gabby Lou on Instagram. They bring us stories of the paranormal that seem to have followed them throughout their whole life and may have followed them into the present. When I was around four or five, I was on holiday at a cottage with my parents. They tell a story about how I'd been in the living room with my dad and out of nowhere pointed at a chair and told them to look at the cat. He had no idea what I was on about. There was no cat there. I was apparently adamant, insisting there was a cat sleeping on the chair. He brushed it off, but a few days later he told my mom and she said that she too had seen a cat while she was in the kitchen and when she turned away for a minute to get it some food, the next minute, it had disappeared. She didn't think anything of it at the time, since cats tend to do their own thing. But they seem to think now that it was the same cat that I'd supposedly been seeing. That was my first paranormal experience, you could say. Now I'm fairly sure something is in my house. I've had basic stuff happen to me. Objects moving around, a box flying down off a shelf that had been stable and landing right where I'd just been standing. That sort of thing. What really made me believe something was going on was when I was getting ready one day. I was doing my makeup in front of my mirror, wearing a baggy shirt. I felt something scrunch up the fabric of my shirt and tug on it hard three times, like when a kid wants your attention. There was nothing else in my room, and nothing behind me that I could have caught my shirt on. Later, I had some friends over to watch movies. Somehow, we got onto the topic of my ghost, whom I've named Derek, and one of my friends started to try and call for him. She kept repeating the name I'd given him, asking if he was there. Give us a sign, she demanded him. Immediately, one of our friend's noses started bleeding, something that had never happened to her before. The worst part is, I think I know where this stemmed from. My friend and I had gone to a house that's said to be haunted in England, I did a bit of research before we went and learned that a monk had been hanged there on the hill for assault and murder, and his body was afterwards dumped down in a well, which the house was later built on top of. We were there with the person running the tour as well as three other people all older than us. First, we toured the living room and were given ghost hunting equipment before going upstairs. He also mentioned that the spirits here seemed to target people when they had their hair up, pulling on ponytails for example. I was the first to go up, pulling my hair into a ponytail as I went, just to see if it would make more activity happen to me. It was a mistake I would pay for. In the bedroom, there were three dolls on the bed. When I walked in, I suddenly felt a strange stabbing pain in my leg, which at the time was strange, but I ignored it until later. Eventually, the others joined me in the room, and someone mentioned that there was someone else on the staircase watching us. She said she could see the shadow peeking around the corner. Suddenly, the equipment I was holding started to vibrate. The man running the tour told me to move to another part of the room to see if that changed anything. The vibrating stopped. Our host went downstairs to get a spirit box to see if we could see any results, and one of the girls in our group moved over to the bed where the dolls were. A note was propped on one of them that said, 
this is Naughty Nora. She likes to scratch people. Immediately, I thought of the stabbing pain I'd felt in my leg. Later, I discovered that it had left a red mark, exactly like I'd been scratched or poked with something sharp. Armed with the spirit box now, we didn't notice any further activity in the room, so we moved to the next bedroom. This room supposedly had a lot of activity around the closet, so we all gathered over there. A woman with us immediately said she felt something in the room, telling us that she felt there was a spirit of a little girl named Emily. Our host invited the little girl to hold the woman's hand, but nothing happened, so he started offering for her to hold anyone's hand in the room. One of my hands went stone cold. When I told the group what was happening, our host instructed this Emily to touch my shoulder, if she could. While nothing happened at that moment, a little while later I felt a strange burning in my shoulder. Sure enough, the next day, I found red marks all around that same area. Eventually, we all drifted to separate areas of the house. A few of us were left in the room where Emily was meant to be, and one of the guys in our group decided to look into the closet. He searched around a bit, moving things about, but ultimately came back with nothing. After that moment, I can't even list how many strange things began to happen. Our spirit box began to say the names of people in our group and pointed out different pieces of jewelry that people were wearing. It was strange and terrifying, but the most terrifying was when it started to demand, more than once, that we leave. We did, but based on what happened afterwards, I think it followed us home. In fact, I think it followed me home. Okay, I've got to say, it sounds like you got a lot of evidence in that house that I'd love to delve into more detail sometime. We can chat on Instagram if you'd like to, or you can send it so we can share it on the show. Some people only have one or two of those experiences in their life, so I found it comical when you said, I've had the basic stuff happen, as if objects moving is something that people should experience in their life more than once, or at once in general. As if objects moving in people's homes is something they should expect. I thought that was hilarious, and hopefully I don't see any objects move in my home after saying that, so ghosts around my home, ignore what I just said. So like I said, some people only have one or two of those experiences in their life, and you've had most of them all in one night. I would have been shaking in my boots, praying, and heading out of there. It definitely sounds like you need to try and say goodbye to the spirit you met in that house and try to get her to leave before anything else happens. Well, that does it for this episode. If you'd like to submit your own personal spooky tale to be read on the show, head to hauntedpod.com and click on the link to submit your story. You can also email me at hauntedpod at gmail.com. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a positive review on Apple Podcast or your podcast player of choice. It really does help. You can find us on Twitter at podcast underscore haunted, Instagram at it's haunted what now, or at hauntedpod.com. Production assistance by Olivia Holmesley and Jesse Hawk. Writing assistance by Meg Williams. The official composer for the show is Neeks at We Talk of Dreams. Check him out on Twitter at We Talk of Dreams or We Talk of Dreams.com. Audio engineering provided by Chez at Gray Multimedia. Until next time. Did you hear that? <laughs>